I hope everyone is uh, full spiritually. Had a great night last night. The guys had an incredible time. Great fellowship in the Lord. You know, it's interesting, and you think about it, there are only a few places where you get to meet the Lord. You can meet Him in your prayer closet in private. And He often will meet you there, and that's special. There are things that He will do just between you and Himself that He won't do uh, in the body. And of course, you know, you can meet Him in His Word and praise and worship songs, and He speaks through that. But also, you can meet Him in other Christians that He's living in. And He can speak to you. And He can buoy you up and strengthen you. And there's a reason, I think it was mentioned in uh, Big Daddy's sermon, you know, that the body has many parts. And regardless of how great and awesome a part you are, you're still, you're just a part. And every part relies on every other part. And I know it's special. It's special because God made this time holy. It's special because He's got things that He wants to do. That's the truth. You know, I, I'll be honest. Every time that we approach the Feast of Tabernacles, I'm always thinking about, it's almost like I make a list to the Lord. Things that I'm thinking about. Things that I want to see uh, maybe barriers out of the way or strictures broken through, chains broken, healing that I want to see accomplished, things that are on my heart. And I know the Lord cares, but how much I care pales in comparison to how much He cares. And the truth is, is that I want Him to get everything that He wants when we come. It's a gift to Him. I know that's difficult to fathom, but it is the truth. We are precious to Him. And the way that we light up when we see a precious little one, like little Ruby back there, and she's so delightful, and how it makes our hearts leap when she does cute little things that she does. The Father feels that way about us, and it's a delight, it's a blessing to His heart. So what I want to talk to you about today is the transformative power of the presence of God. And I know most of you this will be a review for, but for some of you who don't know me, it's not review. So I'm going to tell you about the very first time that I showed up in Arkansas at a little place called Beaver Fork with the Crusade Church who was hosting the feast. So to give you a little background, I had been raised by my grandmother and her health began to fail in about 2000 after some heart trouble and she had open heart surgery. And so I moved back to the house and I began to take care of her. At first, it didn't require a great deal of me just sort of watching over things and that sort of thing. And as her health declined, it was increasingly difficult. It became more and more taxing to the point where she really could do nothing for herself whatsoever. Not even turn over in the bed, not get some water, that sort of thing. And so for two years all by myself. I didn't have anybody else come in. Uh, I just got a little baby monitor is what I did. And I set it by my bed and any time that she could just call out and I would come. And I was privileged to do it. I love that woman like my own heart. And truly, if it were not for her and her steadfast faith and her doing what she didn't have to do. She did not have to raise me. You know, I was her daughter's child. But she cared enough that there, I mean, she was in her sunset years. I mean, she was already getting up in years, you know. She'd already raised two children, but she took me on. And I know that wasn't easy. I know it's hard for you to imagine now. But occasionally, I could test the patience of someone who was in charge of me. At that time, I wasn't as awesome as I am now. So today, I'm going to check my humble box when I get back home. Just check that right off. So anyway, uh, this was a period of about six years where it just got worse and worse. Eventually, I had someone come in and give me a helping hand taking care of her. And I found an opportunity to love somebody beyond what felt like it was possible to do. And it stretched and pushed and pressed me in ways that I could not have imagined. I just couldn't. There was no way to do and in some ways, I think it gave me insight into what the Lord did. Because see, He loved me like that. I wasn't lovable. I was difficult. You know. 
And yet he saw me in my helpless state, messed up as I was, and he came and he took on my burden and he carried it. And not just that, every time it came up that he was going to suffer a slight, an insult, that somebody was going to lay a trap for him. You ever had that experience? That's not easy. I don't know if you've thought about what that's like for Jesus in his public ministry. To have somebody there consciously, always poking and prodding for weaknesses, always working an angle, always sending emissaries, asking loaded questions in a public way, trying to trip you in some way. Look, that's hard. I was a small part of what he bore. But you know, every time something came up where he had to pay, it cost him. Where it, okay, to save David today, you've got to be alone, Jesus, and nobody's going to understand what you're going through, and it's going to hurt. Will you do that? Yeah. Yeah, I'll do that because I love David, and I want to save him. Well, if you want to save David, it means you're not going to be able to sleep. You're going to have to stay up all night. You're going to have to pray because you're going to square off with the enemy. Will you do that for David? Yeah. I love David. I'll do that. You're going to have to be betrayed by one of your very close friends. You're going to have to feel the sting of that. You're going to have to bear the weight of the whole world's sin. You're going to have to drink that cup of every vile, wicked sin that mankind has ever visited on his fellow man and against his maker. And you're going to have to be that sin. You're going to have to be it. You don't just wear it. This is not a robe that Jesus puts on. He drinks it. He internalizes it. He became our sin so that we could become his righteousness. And that means that your, your father's going to have to turn his back on you. You're going to feel a pain that will never be matched. It's not possible. It is, in fact, the greatest pain possible because that is the greatest bond, you see. Perfect unity, perfect love. Always through eternity. Never any different. You will have to feel your father's shame. I'll do that. You're going to have to be beaten. You're going to have to be pummeled so badly that you won't even look human. That's what the Bible says. In order to save David, you'll have to do that. Will you do that? Yes. And at every turn, no matter what it was, no matter what it was, whether it was fasting 40 days, whether it was fighting Satan face to face, so that he could bind the strong man, so then he could plunder his house. All of us here are part of that plunder, by the way. When he won that fight, you see, he had to do that before he could start his earthly ministry and everyone who has been saved. They are the fruit of that. So it made me think about that, that at each moment it was a little thing maybe. You know, like you'll have to give up some of the things that you're accustomed to doing outside the house. You're going to have to give up sleep, you know. And I, I will tell you, there were times where it felt as if, well, as Big Daddy was describing about having a job to do that seemed bigger than his resources to do it with. He was given a job, and it's a little scary because we're all afraid. None of us wants to fail. See, we don't like that. And we look at a thing that's in front of us and then we assess, we do an inventory. Okay, what do I have on my little list of capabilities and characteristics that I can bring to the job? And when that doesn't match up, it's a little scary. And I would spend the night watches often, you know, uh, praying to the Lord, asking for mercy, strength. I had to lean on him in a way that I hadn't had to before. So... She passed away in the spring of 06. And it was, it was a real blessing. She had gotten in her last days where I could no longer keep her at home. She needed round-the-clock skilled nursing care. So finally, in the last, I think it was the last two weeks, she was in a skilled nursing facility. And I couldn't understand her. She tried to talk. She was mostly out of it. And I could see her lips move, but I couldn't hear what she was saying. It was like no, no sound was coming out was where it got to. And so I got where I would leave her for the night to go home. And instead of just talking, I would just put my forehead down on her forehead, you know, which meant I love you. That's what I was saying. And so the night before she passed away, I was there. 
and I put my forehead down on her forehead, and then I kind of jolted, because, I mean, she was alert, and she said something like, uh, well, what did she say? I'm, I'm ready, I think she said. I said, I know you are. You go ahead and go. We're all going to be fine. So I had that moment, and I had that privilege, and that was a tremendous blessing. But I say that, I want you to understand where I'm coming from. This was a protracted and the most difficult trial that I had had up to that point. And you should know that my health was almost completely broken also, simultaneously. I'd been struck by a car on my bicycle and badly, really, just joints dislocated, multiple surgeries and all that was dealing with that simultaneously. And so it was a real press that moment. And also for some background, for those of you who don't know, you know, I... I came up in the Worldwide Church of God, and uh, I, which I think would probably be well described as a non-profit organization, if you know what I'm saying. Worldwide Church of God did not believe in a right now word from God, did not teach. In fact, in my experience, there were quite a few messages that more or less warned you against the working of the Holy Spirit that would say that that is emotionalism, ignoring, frankly, what the example in the Bible is, the way the New Testament church was. I can only speak to my experience. But so you understand me, my knowledge of God, I was saved, and I did. I was faithfully following Him, was already called into the ministry, and was trying to discharge that duty even in the midst of all of this. And, but here's the thing. I knew God... Um, at a distance would probably be the right way to put it. I still probably have those prayer journals from back then, and if you were to read them, it would read like a private reporting to a general. You know, Almighty Eternal God, your servant David is reporting to you and your lofty majesty. And it was very stilted, uh, stultified, stayed, formal. And I had a knowledge of God, I'd accumulated facts, but I had not seen him face to face. I had not heard his voice. I had not felt his touch. I had no experience of that, no knowledge of that. So at this juncture now, I've, I've been in the ministry for quite a few years, and Nana has died, and so my senior pastor, Stephen Glover, invited me to come with his family to Beaver Fork, Arkansas. And it's exciting for me because for the past six years, I've just held services at my house for those who were infirm and not able to travel. They would come, you know, and on the holy days during the feast, and we would have the house, which is wonderful. But it's not the same, you know. It's not the same. This is so glorious. So I was excited about that. But I'm a little numb, to be honest with you, because you know how the grieving process goes. You know, and so I'm up early in the morning, and I still love the early morning time. It's my favorite time. There are two times I really love. The first time I really love is early morning when it's so quiet, so still. There are no interruptions. And it's easy for me to make that connection with the Lord. My mind is fresh. I'm not burdened. It's like everything before me is possibilities, and I want to seek his face. I want to tell him that I love him. I want to hear him say that he loves me. I want him to direct my heart for the day and fill me up. I just, I love that time. That's still quiet. It's a magical time to me. It just is. And then I also love sunset because I'm worn out, but I feel accomplished. And it's the same sort of thing. It's what I would call sweet repose. You know, in, after having worked hard and applied myself all day long, you get that quiet moment. It reminds me of what, we do in the south, you know, to go out and you sit on the porch because it's not quite so hot out there in the evening like it is inside the house. And you can just kind of quietly think over the day, and that's the time I like to reflect back to the Lord and give thanks for all that He's done. And just think back through uh, the day. So this is the morning time, and I'm at my desk and I'm opening the Word, my favorite thing to do. And I'm pouring over the scriptures and I'm wondering to myself, you know, Lord, what do you have in store? And the most shocking thing happened. I mean, I'd never had any experience like this, but I heard the Lord say, 
And I knew it was the Lord. It wasn't one of those things where you go away scratching your head. I heard His voice. And He said, I have everything but your heart, son. Now, I was shocked. I did not know what to make of it. And also, look, it made me mad. I was angry because I thought, what do you mean? What do you mean you don't have my heart? Look at me. I've left everything to go into your service. This is what I'm doing. Right now at this moment, I'm digging through your word because I want to know about you. I want to serve you faithfully. What do you mean you don't have my heart? I didn't like it and didn't know what to do with it. But like so many in the scripture, what am I going to do? I just put it on a shelf. I don't know what to do with it right now. So I just put it aside and I'm in a state of wonder and anticipation. So we load up in the big uh, 13 passenger van or 15 passenger van and make our way to uh, Raccoon Spoon, Arkansas. Or some animal utensil, what a beaver fort. Yeah, I knew there was an animal and a utensil involved. And uh, so we unload and look, we're efficient because let me tell you, the, the Glovers are an efficient bunch. And I mean, uh, as soon as we parked, we got our stuff out. It was all put into cabins and squared away. And Stephen loved to sing the hymns. And we had those purple Worldwide Church of God hymnals. So he said, let's rally up. We got this pavilion. And we'll just meet up at the pavilion and we'll start uh, singing hymns to ring in the holy day as the sun goes down. I thought, that's great. Let's do that. So I go out there and... Uh, there we are, we are opening and we're singing uh, one of those rousing hymns that makes you want to tap your feet. I think uh, it was By the Waters of Babylon, <laughs> perhaps. Anyway, I don't know what it was, but it was glorious. And I did, you know, it was such a release in a way to be here with the brethren and to be at the feast. Well, lo and behold, in the midst of it, here comes this guy just cruising in there. And I don't know him at all. I don't know who it is. And I see this doing this. Internally, I'm thinking, listen, man, we're singing right now. This is not the time for questions. We'll have Q&A at the end of the singing, you know. I didn't know. I hadn't seen people raising their hands in worship. It was unfamiliar. It was strange to me. But I got to talking to him uh, afterwards, and I remember, I, I think that I said to him, look, I think the Lord's got something for me here. I don't know what it is, you know. And I wasn't bold enough or brave enough or trusting enough to tell him what the Lord had said to me at all. But I, I did have a sense of anticipation what the Lord would do. And I felt, I mean, I felt the presence of the Lord even in that moment, you know. So the next day as I'm going to, the, I think it was the next day as I'm going to the sanctuary, uh, the Lord spoke to me through Big Daddy. He was standing there at the front door, if I remember right, to the sanctuary and He said, you are not well known on earth, but you are well known in the courts of heaven. Now that was God talking to me. And I knew it at that moment. It's not just something nice to say. And Larry didn't just think up, well, this will be something good I can do for this your short little goofy kid coming from Montgomery. I should do something nice for him. I mean, look at him. He needs some, something nice to happen. It wasn't that. It was the Lord that spoke through him to me. And he could not have known. You know, that I was reared and I didn't, my father had already abandoned me before I was born. You know, that I had an uncle, but that he had just returned from combat and from the time before I could walk, just crawling through the floor. He couldn't help himself. He would come over and jump right on top of me because in his head, something that roused him out of sleep or surprised him, that was, it's, he didn't think first, okay? It just happened. And that, you know, I'd always thought I must be damaged goods. You know, my mother wasn't really around except for a very brief time when I was about, let's say, between 14 and 15. And that was horribly, horrifically abusive. So as a result of all of these things, it, in my own heart, I wasn't aware that I could be really loved at all. And I did not feel loved, not well loved, not worthy of love. And it's deep. I'm not saying this is a conscious decision on my part. It was not. This is one of those lies that Satan got in there early without my knowledge or consent, but was wreaking havoc on my life. And the Lord addressed that first thing. It reminds me of what He said to His own Son before He could be commissioned. Don't you know? You remember the, the Mount of Transfiguration? Well, let's start with His baptism. 
He went to be baptized. What did the father say to him? Do you remember? I mean, he came up out of the water and everybody around him thought it thundered, but it was God, his father. And he said, behold, my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, which translated out of Bibleese means son, I love you and I'm pleased with you. And he needed that, didn't he need it? Because you know what he was going to do next, 40 days, 40 nights in the wilderness, fasting, no food, no water, being tormented by demons before the very last round where he would go head to head with the enemy of our soul, with Satan. And I don't know how to understand what all he went through. We have a very sparse sketch of that experience. The more that you have to fight against Satan yourself personally, the better insight that you'll get into that. Because there are moments that, I mean, frankly, it just surpasses the human ability to understand. But you know when you're squaring off with the enemy. I've never had Satan's full attention. I don't merit that sort of attention. I hope that I am known among the demons, though. That is one of my goals. If I'm well known in the courts of heaven, I want to be known by Satan and his demons. I want God to be effective through me in that way. And I know that we are as a body. I know that. So that's not conjecture. But understand that he had to do that because he had to stand where all of us had fallen. I mean, he had to put Satan down where everyone else had fallen before him. Adam, all of us. And he did that. But notice that was important to him. And then again, before the cross, the same thing on the Mount of Transfiguration. When he took Peter, James, and John up with him privately. And he was transformed before them. They saw him as he really is. Unveiled. The veil removed. And now shining like the sun. Brilliant in power. Frightening. And yet, uncontrollably attractive at the same time. And the Father spoke to him. And he said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. And notice again, you see, he needed that. It was important. So that's what the Lord delivered to me right at that moment. And here's what was going to happen. I was going to walk into the sanctuary and they were going to begin to do things that I was uncomfortable with, unfamiliar with. I didn't know about people raising their hands in praise, the volume being turned up to 11. You know, well, drums and cymbals. Y'all know I'm talking about Spinal Tap. I'm sorry, but you know. It's just, all right, it's loud, it's long, it's a little disconcerting to me. I don't have experience with this kind of thing. I don't know what to make of it, but I know this, that I've encountered the presence of God, that the atmosphere literally is thick with His presence. And I feel like Moses said that he felt. His knees are shaking. The presence of a holy living God is there on the mountain. It's not that he doesn't feel the fear, but he presses in. He presses into it. Because where else is he going to go? The Lord is there. See, And that's how it was with me. And not only did I witness that, look, I saw things in God's manifest presence I heard His voice speak to me. I felt His touch addressing things hidden deep that had kept me locked down and tortured and tormented in chaos. And I mean, right away He addresses that. And then I watch people healed and delivered and set free in a moment. And look, I've been in the ministry. I hadn't seen anything like that. I wanted to. I prayed about that stuff all the time. I poured over the Scriptures and learned all that I could learn trying to be effective. I don't know how many late nights and I made long trips to people and, and, and begged and cajoled and pleaded and counseled with them looking to see them get these breakthroughs that I was witnessing in the power of the Holy Spirit like that. It's very attractive. I mean, it was powerful, mighty. But I didn't know what to do with it. And I think one of the first messages was encouraging us, as the Scripture instructs, earnestly desire the gifts of the Spirit. Well, I didn't know what to do with that. And I'm not going to be the guy who just hears that and I'm like, oh, okay. I mean, I used to believe a different way, but now that I believe this way. This is good. I mean, I needed to go away like the Bereans and check that out. So I, it was heavy for me. So I grabbed my Bible. I took a short walk to a place, uh, Beaver Lake. It was not too far away. And I got out in one of these little 
pavilions that was situated close to the lake. And I just love places like that. Look, the Lord speaks to me. I love that. And just happened to open the Bible, I think, to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And read through from 12, 13, and 14. And it was reading, and it was talking to the Lord, and it was listening to the Lord. And I spent the day with the Lord out there. And by the time that I got through, look, I was different. I'm not saying I had everything figured out. I'm not saying that at all. I didn't. I didn't understand everything. I don't understand everything now. There are two things, at least two things that I don't completely understand. Uh, But, I mean, it was like I was walking on air. And I, I don't know how to describe the experience of that feast, but what I'm telling you is, Look, it's one thing to hear about God. It's, it's one thing to study and to accumulate facts. All right? It's a completely different thing to see Him face to face. I'm not talking about secondhand knowledge. I'm not talking about at a distance. I'm talking about face to face. I'm talking about this is your Father and you know that is home and you have deep, intimate fellowship with Him. There's power in that, and it will transform you. I think it was John who was testifying when he gave the sermonette about his experience of being delivered. Um, I'm going to say that it was 2005, if I'm remembering it right. I think it actually happened twice. Is that right, John? Yeah. And it's connected with wit and wit being delivered, and we've seen many of those deliverances. But entering into the presence of God. It has the power to immediately transform your heart. And you will for the first time know who you are and who He is. You get both of those things at the same time. Because frankly, until you know Him face to face, you don't really know you. You know. You're made in His image and likeness. Speaking of humility as we did, that's one of the things that I noticed. I, I have to be honest, and I probably came by it honestly, and that is to say, uh, I was always praised for doing work, learning things, uh, speaking well. I went through Spokesman Club, and that's sort of the way it operated. Like, if you showed prowess or promise in that regard, then that you were sort of petted for that and moved moved along and esteemed and all of that stuff. So I, I had in my distant relationship with the Lord, a pretty good sense of pride. Like, look, I'm accomplished. Look at, look at all the stuff that I know and look at how well I'm able to, to communicate those things. And I had that sense until I came into His presence. And when you see His glory, uh, you recognize that you don't have glory of your own. You don't. That's why it's always a signal to me. If I run into someone who's a professing Christian, and I don't see humility, I think to myself, well, they may well be sincere. They may be like the Apostle Paul was. They they may be doing these things in ignorance and unbelief, but I'll tell you this, they ain't seen the Lord yet. Because you don't go away from that without understanding. Well, the two things, uh, the man who wrote Amazing Grace, now his name isn't coming to me, but they asked him the deepest theological knowledge that he had, and he said, well, it's this. I am a great sinner, and that Jesus is a great Savior. And that's pretty foundational. Turn with me, if you would, to Acts chapter 9. Just want to look at that. Just by way of demonstrating a point, there are quite a few examples in the scripture, but this, I mean, you know, Paul is a big hero of mine, for one thing. And. He's probably the most dramatic example that I know of uh, how transformative the presence of God can be. And this is what I was going to say a moment ago. I sort of lost my train of thought. And that is that, uh, you know, I had a fair bit of pride and vanity that I was unaware of. But coming into the very manifest presence of God, that that melted it away in an instant, just like John described. So many things. I mean, and I don't know how many times. It it hasn't stopped yet. There are things, if you're ever watching me and you see the tears streaming down my face when 
like Shane is so beautifully, I mean, I don't think there was one fiber in his being that was withheld in that praise song. And I saw you like a warrior, by the way. That's how I saw I know you were praising the Lord, but man, oh man. Well, when I'm tearing, those are things that are getting melted away from me. I'm experiencing joy in the place of things that had been painful. And the Lord just, it never stops. I'm sure that it won't, frankly, until glory. So I want to think about uh, Paul. We're, we're going to start in chapter 9, but before we do, I'll just give you a little background. You can find it in chapter 7 and 8. Understand, Saul of Tarsus, uh, he's to the manor born. He's in a wealthy family. He's in a prominent city, big city. And this is a guy who's passionate. He's driven. And so he's seeking to attain all the things that appeal to the flesh, things that we might want to attain. So his dad has him study under Gamaliel, who is the greatest of all of the rabbis of his day. He's a high and a lofty man. There's nobody more respected or esteemed than him. And not only does Paul study under him, not only does he have great socioeconomic status, but he's the star pupil. I mean, he says of himself that he excelled all of his contemporaries and companions. There was no one to match Saul of Tarsus in his zeal. And that zeal of learning things about God, I'll tell you this, and you may or may not already know it, but in order to be a Pharisee, in order to comment on Scripture, you'd have to commit the first five books to memory. You were not allowed to comment on a Scripture unless you could quote it accurately. I've never attained to such a thing. I've never been anywhere close to where Paul was. He was at the top when you talk about where you can get to. Here's the irony of that, and it should bring it home to us, especially those of us who, by our nature, would esteem what it is to accumulate facts or to learn things. Look, it has its place. Look, intelligence is good. Being able to communicate is good. Learning things about God, that's good. But those things are servants. They're not the master. They're not the most important thing. I was mentioning, I think I was mentioning to Stan, actually, what I used to tell my students. And that is, imagine, if you will, somebody who has a PhD in George Washington studies. This person has studied the whole life of George Washington, read every biography, read his personal correspondence. He knows the date and the place of his birth. He knows every landmark moment in his life, can quote him on any given issue. I mean, he's a George Washingtonologist. Now, put that guy next to Mary. Or is it Martha? Sorry, Martha. I always do those names like that. Martha Washington. Who do you think knows him better? Everybody knows the answer to that question. Well, it's just like that with the Lord. It's not just learning things about Him. It's not that. It's knowing Him personally. So all of Paul's knowledge, all of his attainment, what is he doing? He's fighting the Lord. He's killing His servants. That's where it got him to. Now look, that's, that's an incredible thing. But it happened. So we're going to break into the narrative right there when the Lord comes to meet with Saul at this point. Verse 1, Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and he asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, that he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So notice whose initiative this is. They didn't call Saul and say, Saul, will you do this job? He was very zealous for his traditions. He was trying to protect Judaism. That's what he was about. And so he went and he got permission so that when he encountered anybody who might be a Christian, that he could bind them, bring them before the authorities, jail them, kill them. And I mean, this is the description, breathing threats and violence. That was what his heart was full of. And that's so diametrically different from how the Lord was. And that should be cautionary to all of us. I mean to say we don't, we don't worship learning things. It's fine and good to learn things. I mean, what we esteem is the Lord. And we know that we're saved by grace through our faith in Him. And that on any given day, 
What we've attained is dirty rags, like Isaiah says. It just is. We just fall short every day. We're never going to be in that place where we can get to the end and say, you know what, today I think I'll just stand on my own record. It's never going to happen. So we're not so foolish as to take pride in the flesh. And it always goes there. And that's what makes every strain of teaching along those lines about learn these things or find this hidden secret knowledge and you'll be part of the elite who know. That's always dangerous and usually it leads to the same place. So there he is, verse 3, and he's traveling. And it happened that he was approaching Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And he fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me. Now he didn't know it. I do want to point out to you that this didn't just happen in a moment. It's not a surprise to the Lord. The Lord had been preparing Saul for this moment. In fact, it had cost the Lord something very precious to get Paul ready to meet the Lord. And that is also informative to us because none of us is here by accident. All of us are here by divine appointment. And God has something for each one of us here that matters to Him and that will bless us. This Paul, as it says in the previous couple of chapters, was standing there when Stephen, I mean the very first martyr, I know that he was precious to the Lord, when he stood and gave a powerful sermon. And just, I mean it's almost like he summarized all of human history. It's like the whole Bible. And as the Lord is talking straight through him, it's so much that those who are hearing it, they can't even stand it. They run him outside the city and they stone him to death. And while they're stoning him, his face is shining like an angel. And they can't bear to look on the face of God or to hear his voice. They stone him to death. And while they're doing it, Stephen says, forgive them. They don't understand what they're doing. Just like Jesus did. So beautiful. And here's Saul standing there watching over the coats of the people who are stoning him and giving hearty approval. That's what it says. And Paul didn't have any idea what the effect of that moment was going to be. Now God spent the life of Stephen, who's a beautiful servant. I know the Lord loved him. I love him. I'm so in awe of that example, how faithful he was, how fearless, how he stood up. And look, what was he doing? But being faithful. He was given the job of administering a food program. I mean, at the point where the apostles said, look, it's not right for us. we got to be in prayer. we got to be in the Word. That's our job. We can't leave our job that God gave us in order to go and serve people food. So he said, you know, you just pick from among yourself some men that are full of the Holy Spirit that are faithful and send them out. And look, he's not doing a glorious job. I mean to say... We in our minds have echelons of work and what the status is for it. This is not one of those things that we would tend to hold up. But was it glorious? It was. He was full of the Holy Spirit and God was working mighty miracles through him. There's no such thing as a small job or an unimportant Christian. We're all vital. And if we will be faithful where we are, God will show up and he will do amazing things. I mean, Stephen's witness echoes through the ages, but the Lord knows this moment that He's going to sacrifice Stephen. He's going to spend that precious life in order to invest in Saul of Tarsus. And that seed comes to fruition in this moment where Jesus showed up and notice He's saying, why are you persecuting Me? So we should pay attention. That's how God sees it. You pick on His kids, you're picking on Him. And look, I mean, isn't that what we're, we're shown in the Scriptures? Look, if you can't love your brother who's in front of you, how is it that you would pretend to yourself that you can love God? You can't even see Him. These are in His image and likeness. Or as Jesus said, it's whatever you do to the least of one of these, you've done it to me. See, that's how it is. And that's really what motivates us. It's hard, isn't it? It's difficult to love someone who's hard to love. I know the Lord has loved me like that, but it's easy to love the Lord, isn't it? After all that He's done for us. Well, see, that can motivate you. When somebody's maybe prickly or difficult or you don't understand them or it feels weird and awkward, then you love them and you understand when you do, when you go out of your way and you bear whatever difficulty there is in it, you're loving the Lord. It matters to Him. 
So Jesus said, why are you persecuting me? And so Paul said, who are you, Lord? Which is a bit of answering your own question. And honestly, I mean, he knows who it is. He knows who it is. And the Lord is just revealing to him in this moment. Now the men who were with him, they stood there. They were speechless, of course. They heard the voice, but they didn't see anyone. So Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him to Damascus. So look at this moment, how things have flipped for Saul of Tarsus. Saul was full of power, full of strength, full of knowledge. He was a head, head and shoulders over everybody else. And really, you know what he thought to himself, man, can I ever see? I see so much, I know so much. Now he's seen the Lord, and he recognizes he's blind. That's what happens. When you meet the Lord, you understand. Whatever it was that you thought you knew, you see very dimly. I mean, you, you are reckoning the universe through a penhole. You have a child's understanding. I mean, he is king of the universe. He created everything, the intricacies that weren't even known to man. Man did not understand the, these great galaxies that we can see now through the Hubble telescope and the glories that are there. They will take your breath away when you look at the multicolors like a riot of color against the pitch black of space. And you wonder the artistry of God and He created and hid that beauty there that man couldn't even see for all these thousands of years until our time. How amazing. Or the same thing is true down into the depths of the ocean. If you look in the, like the Marianas Trench and there are little animals that are bioluminescent and they're multicolored and the way that they move is more beautiful than any dancer you will ever see. And it makes your heart leap inside and you think, what majesty He's placed here. And it doesn't matter whether you're looking through a microscope or a telescope. The whole of creation shouts the glory of God. And then you wonder, you know, you see yourself rightly for the first time when you see Him. And this is Paul. It's a painful lesson, but now he's going to have to be blind. The truth is he's been blind a long time. The difference is that now that he's seen the Lord, he knows it. And that's a blessed thing because the Lord can do something with that. So, verse 9, And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. And wasn't he wretched and naked and blind and poor all this time? Now he's just experiencing it. And that happens. Very often that I don't know how it's going to be otherwise. It's painful in a way to meet with the Lord. It's hard to have to look into the reflection of that reality. How the Lord brought me to Himself in the very first place anyway. I mean, He just held up a mirror. You know, I had vowed I would never become the thing that I hated. I was so violently angry about in my the way I looked at it I was betrayed because I was smacked around and I was just as likely to get beaten for doing something right as wrong and that does violence to everything I mean it just sets your whole world in chaos and so I shook my fist at God but I vowed that I would never become the thing that I hated I would never do that I would never be the bully I would never and so in the midst of my rebellion some around my 20th year. I, I went full on rebel at 18 and the Lord intervened with me at 20. And that's how He broke me. That's exactly how. I mean, He just pointed right back at me and He says, well, how are you any different then? You hadn't pushed people around? You haven't manipulated people? You haven't used people to your own ends? Well, how are you any different? And I was undone. I was just undone. And Paul is having that moment. It is painful. It can be painful. But look, it's like the pain of a surgery. Nobody wants to experience that. It's difficult. But there's healing. There's healing on the other side. It's infinitely worth it. And that's what Paul is experiencing for these three days. Verse 10, Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, now look, I know that we're just passing right through this, but understand, Jesus is already risen. This is the New Testament church that we're talking about. And notice that people are seeing Jesus. People are hearing His voice. 
that the Lord is giving visions to people and instructing them, giving them a word of knowledge. Look, this is normal. Now, you may not have had experience or you may not have been taught this, but read in the Bible, you will see. That's how it's supposed to be. So this is the description of what's going on with Paul, and God knows what He's going to do with him, so that's the reason that He gets to Ananias and explains to him what's, uh, what's going on. So the Lord said to him, Ananias, and he said, here I am, Lord, which, by the way, doesn't just mean if you were looking for me, this is my GPS coordinates. What that is is willingness. It's like saying whatever you want, Lord. When you say here I am, it's like command me. I'll do whatever it is that you want. So he says, here I am. And so Ananias said, or the Lord said to him, verse 11, get up, go to the street that's called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. And you know what? How much do you think Paul had prayed? I bet he prayed a lot. I bet he was like the parable. I bet he made long prayers in public because he had to outpray his contemporaries. But this was a real prayer from a humble heart. This was much more like the man who bent down, wouldn't even look up and beat his chest and said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Paul is now praying from a place of real sincerity. And the Lord, of course, is making a way. Verse 12, And he's seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. And Ananias, as you might imagine, I mean, sometimes the Lord will do this. Just be prepared. You don't ever know what He's going to send you into. All you can do is trust that He's got you covered. Whether you are Stephen, perhaps, there will be a Stephen moment for you. Maybe. If that's how God sees fit to invest your life, if He wants to glorify Himself and elevate you to that position of glory and give you the privilege of putting you on a stage and shining a white-hot spotlight on you, so that that moment of your testimony, giving your last full measure of devotion, breathing your last breath, testifying to the Lord. Look, that's glory. And he might do it. Well, when he's talking to Ananias, what does Ananias know? Well, he knows Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus is the scourge of all Judaism. What I mean, of all Christianity, rather, I should say. That those who follow the way, as they were called at the time, that when Saul is coming, that just means that somebody's going to come snatch you up in irons and put you in jail or kill you. And God's saying, okay, I got a job for you, Ananias. All right, whatever you want. All right, I want you to pray for Saul of Tarsus. I mean, everything but that, you know. But he knows that the Lord is, is right. And he look, there's a fear. There's a fear there. But what is greater than his fear is his trust for the Lord, so he's going to follow what the Lord said. So Ananias, of course, at first said, Lord, I've heard much about this man, how much harm he did to your saints in Jerusalem, and here he's got the authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. And the Lord said, go. He is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Uh, number one, you don't ever know about people. I don't know why, and I'll never understand. It's just love, I guess. The reason for my grandmother's optimism. Like, she never faltered, even in the midst. Look, I lived out loud as a sinner, and I gave nobody any reason for hope. I, I probably, the more I examine it now that I'm an adult, I must have wanted to destroy myself. Because of my behavior. I mean, I was behaving in such a way as to bring self-destruction. Very, uh, a very trouble. And yet she never faltered or flagged or fainted. She just kept on faithfully praying for me and always believed, you know. Well, I mean, here you see this guy is Saul of Tarsus. You couldn't pick a guy that's worse. I mean, he's the worst enemy that Jesus had in that day and the most effective one. But... God knew who he was in his heart, and he knew how it was that he was going to get through to him. And Paul, as you know, is going to bear probably more of the burden. I just don't know anybody, aside from Jesus, that suffered like Paul. I don't. 
It's amazing to me what he went through. And the Lord said, I'm going to show him all the things that he has to suffer. But he's a chosen vessel of mine. But how did he go from Saul of Tarsus? And if time permits, I'm sure that we only have just a few minutes. Let's go to Philippians 3, and I'll do as much as we can here. Uh, Philippians 3 and probably 1 through uh, 14, if possible. I just want you to get what happened. How many sermons do you think that Saul of Tarsus heard? From learned men. How many books do you suppose that he read? Scrolls they would have been. He was a highly educated man. He knew a lot about God, but he didn't even know Him. Now, as he confessed himself, I did those things ignorantly and in unbelief. But look what a difference it made when he encountered God in person. See, that's what's powerful. And I'll tell you, because of those things that I saw, I have never been the same since 2006, and I never will be the same. Increasingly, I just don't care. I know I was remarking to one of you, I don't, it was probably Stan again, I guess I've talked to you a lot, that, uh, you know, I used, to, I used to think the thing was to be polished. If you're speaking on behalf of God, that you should have an outline, A, B, C, 1, 2, 3, and you'd better figure it out long beforehand and think about, you know, how can you use alliteration? Maybe everything could start with the letter P. I mean, that'd be good for the Lord, right? And I want to appear like I know everything. I don't want to get up there and be forgetting stuff or stammer or stutter, right? What is that about anyway? I think a lot of that is driven by vanity and pride, honestly. I mean, even if it's maybe a childish attempt to do a good job, but I mean, what are you even calling a good job? I've seen the fruit of that. I've seen the fruit of having it all prepared. And look, Lord, you have my permission to inspire me as long as you inspire me exactly like this and at this moment, because we've got to print the programs for this weekend anyway. You know, so don't be changing anything. It's a dead thing. Give me a right now word from the Lord. I'd rather utter one syllable under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit than a thousand words out of the machinations of my own mind. And I've witnessed it. I've witnessed it in practice. People that would go away, I had lines of people that would line up when I very first started preaching. They would come up and, oh, I mean, I had lots of praises. That made me feel good. I'm doing a good job for the Lord. But really, I mean, it was the flesh, wasn't it? And those people didn't walk away different. I don't know what people need to hear, even if it's the best thing that I can think of. But experiencing the Lord speak through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit right now words, man, I've seen so many lives transformed. See, they're having an experience of God. They're meeting Him. And He's just able to move. That's the way I want it. That's the way I like it. So powerful. Let's, let's hear from Paul. This is Philippians chapter 3. Um, and I want to pick the right. I may not. Give me just a moment, if you will. Yeah, I, w- I guess I will start in one. So he says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again to you is no trouble to me. And it's a safeguard for you. Beware of the dogs. Beware of evil workers and the false circumcision. For we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit, or yes, in the Spirit of God and the glory in Christ Jesus. And we put no confidence in the flesh. And man, is that ever saying something? Because this is a man who had all his confidence in the flesh. He's the biggest example. Like you could not create a more archetypal person to transform. If you're going to show the power of God and how He works in our human weakness and frailty and not through our high and lofty attainment, you can't do better than Saul of Tarsus. I mean, he even said it himself, I feel like sometimes I'm just a trophy. Like God's putting me up here on display to say, look what I can do through a humbled man. And you know, he was circumcised a long time, but he wasn't truly circumcised. It shows it's not an outward thing, it's a spiritual thing. Verse 4, though I myself, I might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. 
I was circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of the Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, persecuting the church, as to righteousness, which is in the law, found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things, and I count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. Now this isn't like a guy who's living as a bum saying, look, I count all of my savings and all of my investments and all of my earthly possessions, I count them all as lost. Because all he had was rags in a box anyway. That's not, this, is, this is Bill Gates. Okay, This is a guy who has billions and billions of dollars, so to speak in terms of the edifice of his life that he had built up. You can't accomplish more. Here he is at the pinnacle. And he says, that is a big, heaping, steaming pile of dung as far as I'm concerned. I put no value in it. I see where that got me. You know where that got me? It got me trying to kill the very one I claim to love and serve. I don't put any confidence in that. I don't care about that. I count it all as loss. For what? The surpassing value of knowing Christ, knowing Him. That word knowing. That is not intellectual collection of facts. That is this phrase. And Adam knew Eve, and they begot a child. That's the kind of knowing. That is the kind of knowing. It's gnosko. That's what it's talking about. It's intimate knowledge. That's not head knowledge. You see, that's hearing His voice. That's feeling His touch. And I'm telling you, brethren, if there's anybody in this house that has not had that experience, that's what you're here for. That's exactly why you're here. Because that's what the Lord wants. And it's the thing that... There is no other thing that will surpass it. I mean, look, I've chased it all, and the, the history books are filled. The pages are just filled. It's like looking at a, like an old shipyard or a graveyard for airplanes. Or, it's just wreckage all over the place of people chasing after everything that isn't God. And what's sad about that is there's no life in any of it. You can get to the end of it. I'm, it's almost a proverb. And I know people don't believe me when I say this. But it's one of those things that I've studied a little bit. Every person, I mean, it's, it's not the exception. It is the norm. When you achieve, I mean, if you're Neon, uh, Neon Dion Sanders, he won finally the Super Bowl with his football team. He's a great athlete. And he got home to his hotel room. First thing he did was make a phone call and order up a Ferrari or a Lamborghini or something like that. And he's got the big old ring. And he says himself in his own testimony, I wanted to die. I thought this would finally fill all the void when I finally got the thing that I'd worked so hard. Think about the work he had put in from the time that he was in Pee Wee League football. How much pain and sweat and effort went into that that didn't culminate until he was 30 some odd years old. That's a lot. And he thought that was going to fill it. That would do it. The thing is, it's empty when you get there. It's empty. Nothing is the Lord but the Lord. You see. And it's true. I mean, you, you can think about whoever you want. Whether it's J. Paul Getty. I mean, it's just common that people, when they chase after anything that isn't God, it leaves them empty. I can't remember who said it. I wish that I could. But they said that they almost envy people who hadn't attained wealth. Because at least that they could comfort themselves with the false notion that if they had money, that it would fulfill them. Because he knew. It doesn't. It doesn't. So when Paul says, I count those things as loss for the sake of Christ, Paul knows what he's talking about. Verse 9, he says, may be found in him not having the righteousness of my own derived from the law. And again, it's powerful because it's coming from Paul. This is a man who staked his very life on that and probably rose above anybody else in that respect. And he says it's empty, it's worthless. But that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of that faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection, I hope that we can realize that somehow. I hope that I can realize that. I want to realize it more. 
I think we have no idea the kind of power we're sitting on. That's the truth. God knows. And Satan knows. I'm not sure that it's dawned on us the power that we possess. I mean, it says, the Bible plainly says the power that raised Jesus from the dead is alive in us. That's power. It's no mean thing. So he's saying that to know the power of the resurrection... And the fellowship of His sufferings being conformed to His death, and that's equally powerful. We're called to die every day. It's necessary. Look, uh, the way that I like to put it is, pain is temporary. Glory is eternal. You're never going to be sorry about making that trade. You never will. I'm reminded of a time when it was late. It was late for pastor, which is really early in the morning. So When it's almost time for me to get up, it's late. So he's in his chair, and I think he'd fallen asleep, actually, in his, uh, in his recliner. And then he woke up, and uh, the Lord was calling him to prayer. said something like, you should pray or something. And he thought to, to himself, well, I'm tired right now. Probably be better. Probably be better if I prayed in the morning when I'm fresh and I'm all clear-headed. But then he heard, the flesh dies in prayer. And he's convicted. So he was just obedient. That's all. Just simple obedience. And he prayed. It was powerful that what was accomplished in that prayer, both with him and I'm sure whatever the subject of the prayer was about, was important and vital. That's the kind of thing that we're called to day to day. That's the kind of thing that Brian was talking about. It's the sacrifices that you make. Something will, something will be sacrificed. I know that I'm not going to... Look, you can exhaust the Bible... I had 20 different examples of people dramatically changed. You can look into any one of them. When the Lord meets with people, whether you're talking about Moses or Jacob, you're never the same. Or Job. I mean, Job in particular. In that Job's own testimony was, look, I'd heard about you by the hearing of the ear. It's not like I didn't know you were there. But now, it's like scales have fallen off. I see you face to face. It was forever different for Job. It's a powerful thing. So going back to what, what Brian was saying, I'll, I'll tell you this about my circumstances and then uh, let's see, I have McCullen come and close in prayer. So I've embarked on uh, doing the scientific courses that I have to take in order to qualify to go to physical therapy school. As I'm eager to have something a little more permanent um, that I can depend on to make a living so that I can have food, clothing, and shelter, and I'd like at some juncture to be in the place where I'd have enough investments that I could spend a substantial amount of time in the Word and in prayer. So it seemed good to me, and after some counsel, this is the path that I embarked on. And so it's, it's been something else here now at 47 going to school versus when I was 20. You know, there's a lot more stuff to do. And the old gray cells, they ain't what they used to be. So I do, I find it challenging. I've noticed... Now, I'm taking physics and chemistry, neither of which is a strong suit for me. I'm much stronger in things that are uh, what I would call qualitatively driven. I like that. So I enjoyed, say, physiology, anatomy, biology, medical terminology, all these things, right up my alley. Lots of work, but that's normal kind of work, like it gets to be in my wheelhouse, so I dig it. But uh, physics and chemistry are not that way. It's all things that are weak for me. And I'm not getting back the results that I want to get back. I've got to make really good grades if, I, if I'm going to be able to get into this school. And so I find the call to spend and invest more and more time. Give more time. So, you know, you can't fail. You certainly can't fail. You're going to fail. I hear these things in my mind. Now... It's a long-standing habit that I seek God's face. I do it in the morning. I do it when I lay down at about noontime. I usually lay down for about 30 minutes. And I do it in the evening. And it's sacrosanct. Look, things do not interrupt that time. That's an appointment I will keep. But I've, I've felt all of those cares knocking on the door of those things with me. And I have had, I will say, the temptation to... Well, look, it's just, I've got this exam coming up. I mean, I can't help it that this is the time for that. I don't care. That's where I've had to come to. I don't care. I will make that sacrifice. If that's a sacrifice, what is that? 
I mean, what difference? The one thing that I can't lose is his presence. Because what if I, if I had, if I gained the whole world, if I lose that, if I lose walking intimately with him, I'm in no way prepared. I would never trade it, not for an A, not for a position, and not for a paycheck or a career ever. So I just share that. I hope that it, that blesses someone. I don't know why the Lord had me share. I didn't plan to, but so there you are. So just to sum up, <clears throat> this is about the transformative power of the presence of God. There's nothing more important. A thousand sermons will never measure up to one moment in His manifest presence. If any of that seems weird to you, like when you come in here, if it's uncomfortable that people are raising their arms or that things are loud, and you feel that you have to press through and maybe the enemy tells you, well, this shouldn't be hard and all of that, push through. Push through it. The Lord is on the other side of it. And He's got things for you that your heart longs for and you don't even know it. Places that you'll be free where you've been bound that you didn't even know about. And two, it will bless His heart. There's nothing more powerful. There's nothing more valuable. Praise the Lord. Come on.